Good morning. Good morning. Uh, great to see you in full room this morning. And we will get started. So if you'll please rise. We'll have our invitation followed by the display. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for giving us. Thank you for men and women in this room this morning and, and the impact uh, we're able to have in this community. I just pray that you'll continue to bless this club, guide, direct um, our decisions, and just uh, thankful for the opportunity uh, to give back. I just pray that you continue to watch over our first responders, um, those that are protecting us at home and away, and just uh, let them feel uh, your support and uh, love for them. Uh, thank you for this food. Uh, bless, them. bless us to the nurture of our eyes. Amen. 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 Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. So, um, any guest this morning? Yes, sir. Hey, good morning. Uh, I have Kyle Brown with me this morning. So, uh, Kyle and his wife, Leanne, have been in Lake Highlands for 25 years. Uh, moved here after he uh, got out of the U.S. Army, after graduating from West Point. Um, those that have been around for minute or two may remember Kyle as our One Nation Under God speaker back in the, I think maybe in the off call administration <laughs> years, right? so, uh, um, so he's, uh, he, he's popped in here before, but here is my guest this morning. Um, uh, Kyle's thrown his uh, hat in the ring to run for school board for District 5, which uh, these days, um, throwing your hat in for something like that should be, uh, uh, should be celebrated. So, uh, <laughs> so I hope uh, everyone will take a, take a minute to uh, introduce yourself to Kyle after the meeting and, and get to know him and uh, thank him for, uh, for being here with us today. My daughter Lucy. <laughs> Lucy is in fourth grade and enjoys history, so uh, we were talking with someone else who has a guest and decided let's bring our fourth graders to this presentation. So. Hey, Lucy. Yes, sir. Resident fourth grader, this is my son Campbell. This is Resident fourth grader day at Exchange. This morning. All right, so we've got a busy announcement for the morning. So we'll get right to it. So I'm going to fill in for Joe uh, Priestley this morning. Um, Joe and his wife had their baby this week, so he is out. But I have a couple um, auction announcements. So uh, the auction is well on its way. Uh, May 21st, Saturday, May 21st is the event, Gillies. Um, the <clears throat> site being Facebook, whatever social media platform, will all go live today. Um, so, May 21st, the concert portion will be Jack Ingram, mm. and we'll be at Gillies. Set. So, Mark and Calendar, Jack Ingram, Gillies, May 21st. Um, all the information will be coming out shortly as far as tickets and how that goes, but um, it's a great event to invite other um, friends in the neighborhood to, so be thinking about that as well. Um, so that is coming up. Uh, Hank has a couple more add-ons to that announcement as well. Thanks, so um, as you know, Solid auction and live auction items. Uh, we're making really good progress right there with Ray Fox and Mark Molly. If you don't have ideas, please reach out to us and let us know. You know, year to year, some things drop off because they were one time. So anything that y'all may have uh, suggestions or friends, um, especially a live auction item, you know, that kind of thousand dollar, two thousand dollar item, please reach out to us and kind of let us know. Um, same thing on the solid auction. Items. It's a hundred bucks or fifty bucks. Um, ideas. We'll still take those. Um, we are. <coughs> raffle this year as well. Um, so details come on that. Um, we may put that on the Facebook post. Um, we're going to have the details. Um, we'll see changes to that side. So, um, again, uh, make good progress. If you have ideas, let us know. And looking forward to it in a couple months. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. 
Thank you, Hank. So yes, if you you know do have some live side auctions, please uh, reach out. Um, that's how we generate some funds uh, for the club. So um, be thinking about that. Also, as you start to see the social media posts, please like, share. Um, that's how we get the word out as well. So you'll be hearing a lot about that over the next couple of months. Um, so put that in your calendar. Um, we can officially talk about band and location, all that kind of too. So pretty excited about that event. Um, so next week, um, show up early. We've got Youth of the Month. Um, and why I say early is we've got two months to do. So we'll be honoring eight students next week. So it'll be a uh, jam-packed morning. So I'm going to do great. I'm either going to crash and burn, or we're going to have a really good time. You should come just to see what happens. Eight. Yes. So Jimmy will be doing that. Um, Thankfully, Chris Brown has agreed to sub in for me. I'll be out next week, so you'll, you're stuck with Chris next week. Um, so I will, I will hear all about uh, how Jimmy did. So <laughs> no announcements. If you have announcements for next week, make them right now. No announcements will be had next week. Um, and then, so just as we go looking at the calendar, um, April 8th, the following Friday, is our candidate form. So we'll have all three RSD candidates on that Friday, April 8th. Um, so we will uh, have a fun morning then as well. Um, all right, so moving forward, uh, April 21st is our third Thursday, um, and we are going to do a, call it um, meeting as well, but it'll be a, a spousal member recruitment, member event, um, all wrapped into one. So. April 21st, um, that Thursday, will be at OHP um, in their little back area. They do have a food truck of some sort that day, or night, excuse me. So um, if you would like, what we'll do this time is the food truck will be on you. Um, we'll have some sort of beverage tickets for you all. Um, but if you want to eat, then the food truck will be available to you, um, or you all can eat before you come. So 7 o'clock. April 21st, spouse, significant other, friend, neighbor, whoever you want to bring, um, guest, member event, um, recruitment event. So all that wrapped into one. Um, we'll also have a little bit of an auction kickoff as well. Just hopefully we've got some prospective members and guests that can hear all about the auction. Um, benefit concert. Um, so let's see. Oh, I had another announcement. Um, so, Bryn Boltmer texted, um, if you are bored and have a CDL or would like to go get your CDL, I don't know how that works, but, um, how quickly you can do it, uh, they are, the high school is in need of people to drive buses for sports teams and whatnot, so, if you become an RSD, you're hired through RSD, and then you get to drive the bus to games, watch the game, and drive the kids home. So, as many know, Coach Higgins um, still drives for the high school, longtime baseball coach. So, they're just in need of more. So, if you have one and, or know someone that does that would like to drive for the high school, uh, please reach out to either myself, or I can touch, excuse me, in touch with a friend, or you can go <coughs> directly to Brent. So, I told her I would mention that, so, you know, if, if available and like to do that, there's an opportunity. So, uh, let's see, any other announcements? This is this. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, uh, next week, Tuesday, Wednesday, we're at the high school interviewing 60 high-achieving high school seniors for scholarships. Uh, we're going to be there from 9.30 to 3.30, and we've had a couple last-minute cancellations. A couple guys on the scholarship committee can't make it. So if you have availability and want to join us, um, there's some room. We've got critical mass, so it's not it's not a must ask. But if you're if you've got the flexibility in your schedule and want to come interview some high school seniors with us, we'd love to have you. Either grab me after the meeting or shoot me an email. Thanks. Yeah. So speaking of our benefit concert, the auction component, um, that is how we are able to uh, recognize some great uh, students. So um, if you are available, please reach out to Brent. Um, always a good, good time to see uh, those kids. So 
Yes. What was that date? What's that? Tuesday, Wednesday. Next week. 2930. So, uh, seeing any other announcements? <coughs> All right, I'll have uh, Mr. Bill Wood come up and introduce the program today. Thank you, thank you. Always good to get that warm green. So, it's an exciting morning at Exchange Club. It, it, it is early. I expected when we said Jack Ingram that Karen would have, would have made a lot more noise. Than <laughs> Needs more coffee. And, Shout out to Rick Mosley. We have new microphones. I kind of like the old mics. They were a good test for our speakers to see if they could listen to hold the mic with exactly one finger in the right way. But uh, these new ones, hopefully, will be working a little better. So this morning, our speaker is Brian Franklin. Brian works at SMU and is the Associate Director of the Center for Presidential History and is a lecturer in the Department of History a department of history where he regularly teaches Texas history. Um, his research writing focus is on religion, politics, and regional identity in the early new United States. He's currently completing his uh, first book, which is gonna be called America's Missions, which is a study of the Protestant mission societies and their influence in the first 50 years of the United States. He's written multiple articles about uh, religion in New England, Baptists in uh, the American West, and the, and I kind of found this one kind of fun, the importance of primary sources in reading Texas history. So hopefully we'll hear about that in, in just a little bit. So Brian grew up in Odessa. He went to college at DBU and then earned his PhD in American history from A&M. Um, he and his wife, Janelle, who've been married for 16 years, and their three kids moved to Dallas in 2012. Uh, the kids go to Richardson schools up in far north Dallas in the uh, Northwood Hills area. And they are also active members at New St. Peter's Press down here in Lake Highlands. So with that, oh, he's also very tolerant of people on the phone talking to them, calling him Benjamin instead of Brian. <laughs> 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 pleasure to be here, um, especially because I feel like I'm just on the edge, you know, this is Lake Highlands and I live in Northwood Hills, just on the edge, and I have um, a, a brown-haired third grader, which is close to a red-haired <laughs> um, but uh, close enough to be here, so no, I really appreciate you all um, having me, I have a lot of love for Lake Highlands, I'm down here a lot, as was just mentioned, and um, and I've been called Benjamin so many times in my life that I don't even think about it anymore, so uh, no worries. Uh, so what I wanted to talk with you just a little bit about today is, uh, is Texas history. I love teaching Texas history. I'm a born and raised Texan. I've made my way all around the state through uh, um, schooling and work and have managed to somehow get to stay here. And I wanted to kind of focus in on one particular moment in Texas history known as the Republic of Texas. And I call today's talk One Nation Under Duress. Now, if you're a native Texan, or even if you're not, you know that Texans are pretty proud of their state. And especially uh, in the spring, we'll like to talk about just how great the Republic was and what a golden time it was and how maybe we should go back to that time. And, what I want to suggest to you today is, listen, I love Texas, I'm a proud Texan, just ask my class, they're probably sick of me saying so. But, this was a tough time. This was a nation under duress. This was a nation that really couldn't even settle a couple of really significant and central things about itself. Should it even remain a nation? That's a pretty uh, important question to ask, and there was huge disagreement about this. Who even belonged in the nation and could count themselves a Texan? Significant disagreement over that. Those are just two examples. And the way I want to get at that is looking at the first two presidents of the Republic, these two men here, and just give you a sense of what their contrasting visions were, what they represented about a lot of different Texans at the time. I'm not sure if you've ever lived or been in a time when 
there was significant disagreement about what a nation <laughs> should be. Um, <laughs> contrasting visions between successive leaders. I just just try to imagine. <laughs> Step out of your time. Um, but I hope that one of the things that history can always do for us is give us not just uh, an example that we can use to kind of as a weapon for today, but actually as a moment to step outside of our time and see the different struggles and the different questions that another time had as a way of maybe helping us understand that uh, our problems aren't so unique, but also our solutions don't have to be so unique either. Uh, and that there are ways to um, be more hospitable to one another, just like we are to historical figures who live outside of our time. We can do the same today. So I want to start uh, with Sam Houston, who I'm sure is a name that most of you are familiar with. Sam Houston came from Tennessee, like a lot of great Texans, including my wife. <laughs> and uh, he, he grew up in, in East Tennessee, uh, and rose to political prominence there. You may know that I believe he's still the only person who's ever served as governor of two different states. He rose to the U.S. House in Tennessee, became governor of Tennessee, um, was a close uh, friend and protege of uh, one of the most popular politicians in that period, Andrew Jackson. And when he came and uh, helped win the Texas Revolution as the leader of forces there, uh, he sort of slid right into the presidency, overwhelmingly elected as the first president. In fact, was elected over who we might think of as one of the most popular people of the time, Stephen F. Austin. St. Houston wanted an absolute landslide, which tells you at least one thing. Things were changing very quickly in Texas, so that the person who was considered the father of Texas got the least number of votes in that election. And the, <laughs> the newly arrived leader was the one who got the most votes. By far, it wasn't even close. And he gets started um, organizing the republic, and there are a handful of topics that I'd like to talk about with you on both of these presidencies, just to kind of give you a sense. So the first question is annexation, the process of should Texas become a state? Sam Houston was very forward about this in his inaugural address, Texas should become a state in the United States. There was no, there was no business talking about should Texas remain a republic. Houston was very focused Texas is not going to be, make it as a republic. Its only hope is to become a state. That was his goal. What would the boundaries of Texas look like? I'm going to show you this map here that gives you a sense of what Texas looked like at the time. And what you really should pay close attention to is there's this line that kind of cuts through the middle of what we think of Texas today. That was really the far boundary of where uh, non-native Texans lived in Texas at the time. If you crossed that boundary, you were in only in Comanche land. And all of this area between that and the Rio Grande was highly disputed. Texans after the revolution claimed that it was theirs. Mexico did not recognize that at all, nor did other nations around the world, including the United States. Because once you recognize a territory, uh, you are saying something about the, the country who doesn't recognize that territory. And the US was not interested at this point in going to war with Mexico. It would be in about a decade after this, but not <laughs> at this point. And the third thing is the capital. Uh, some promoters got together and they decided down in the southeast part of the state that a swamp would be a really good place to plant a new city. And you know what would be really good is if they could name it after Houston and convince him to move the capital there. And that's exactly what happened. Okay, in early 1836, the city of Houston, listen, we're all in Dallas, so we can all rag on Houston, <laughs> uh, had like a dozen people in it. And once it was chosen to be the capital of the new republic, it grew to 1,500 within a few months. Okay, and uh, But just to give you a sense of what it looked like, this is kind of a, a rendering of the executive mansion, and this uh, was President Houston's first official residence at Houston in 1837. So, uh, not quite the skyscraper city that you imagine today. Um, but it moved there for a couple of reasons. I'm sure there was a little bit of vanity involved in Houston saying, yeah, it would be great to have the Republic in the place. Oh, Houston, what a great name. Uh, but also, the center of Texas population at that time was down toward Houston and down toward the Gulf Coast. And Houston's imagination was, this is where the population is, and I want it to move, and with our eyes looking eastward toward the United States. So it was moved to Houston. 
And then the third topic I want to tell you about is diplomacy. What does this new republic, which is independence, do in terms of relating to other places? Well, the first place that Sam Houston engages is the United States. I told you, immediately calls for annexation, immediately sends Texas representatives to the United States to lobby on behalf of this new republic um, in Washington, D.C. Sam Houston's relationship with Mexico. Well, he just won a war over them, but it was a pretty limited win, and he was always concerned that Mexico would just take Texas back immediately. And Mexico had never recognized Texas independence at all. And he's concerned about Mexico, too, because uh, very soon into his presidency, a certain Santa Ana, who he just won this battle over, is traveling to Washington, D.C., and there are Mexican representatives in D.C., and they're actually getting a friendly ear with a lot of congressmen. Now, can you imagine with me, why would Mexican officials get a happy and welcome leadership in the United States Congress at this period? There's one very specific reason. Mexico was a very well-known anti-slavery nation. And there were some leaders in the U.S. Congress, including former President John Quincy Adams, who did not want Texas anywhere near the United States because they called Texas um, a scheme in which to cram more slaves into the Union. That's what John Quincy Adams and many congressmen believed about Texas. So they gave a friendly reception to Mexican officials coming to say, you need to help us work on this. But um, they continue to not recognize Texas, and Houston is sort of maintaining a detente. And then the third group, sorry, go back to that, is um, Native peoples. You may know, you may not, Sam Houston, as a teenager, ran away from home in East Tennessee and went to live with the Cherokee for several years uh, before the Cherokee were later forced out and forced to places like Texas and Oklahoma. Their home is in what we think of today as Tennessee and North Carolina. He went and lived with them and sort of set a long, lifelong friendship with the Cherokee in particular, but a lifelong view of how Anglos should interact with native peoples. And in his inauguration, a few of the kind of phrases that come out of his inauguration that give you a sense of what he thought about how the Texas Republic should relate to natives, abstain from aggressions, establish commerce, even-handed justice, friendship, these are the words that he spoke at his inauguration. And at this time, we had native peoples all around Texas, including the Cherokee in, um, in this area and north of here, Comanche, many others. So this is a sense of Houston's vision, right? Annexation, friendliness of native peoples, careful with Mexico. Then this man, Mirabeau Lamar, is elected to be president next. Now part of the reason he's elected is because in the Texas Constitution, there was a stipulation that said there could not be successive president. You couldn't be elected to successive presidencies. So Houston couldn't even run. He probably would have won again if he did, but he couldn't. And someone wins who is quite the opposite of Houston. Someone who does not like Houston. Someone who hates Houston. Okay, Mirabel Lamar was from Georgia. He had been a commander in, in the Texas Army during the Revolution. He was considered a hero at San Jacinto. And he came in with an ax to grind against Sam Houston. Again, just imagine this sort of thing with me. I understand that it's hard to imagine, but these things happen. So he comes in to office um, in 1838. Um, and it doesn't start well for him to give you a sense of how much he and Houston hate each other. Lamar is going to have it at his inauguration. And he's supposed to come and you know, big celebration of the new president. He's going to give his inaugural speech. And when he gets there, he spies Sam Houston. Not invited. <laughs> Except Sam Houston isn't dressed normally. Sam Houston has a powdered wig and these special boots on and these special buckles. And he's basically dressed like George Washington. Right? George Washington, the guy who won the revolution and who was swept into the presidency. Sam Houston came dressed as George Washington to Mirabel Lamar's inauguration and then got up and decided to give an uninvited speech that lasted almost three hours. <laughs> and Lamar was so furious and agitated that he literally could not give his speech and gave it to a secretary to deliver it. Right? That's how things got started. <laughs> Just imagine that on Inauguration Day in D.C., right? Like, President Joe, nope, sorry, I'm Donald Trump, I have something to say. <laughs> Three hours, right? Like, that's, I mean, I mean, that's good TV. So, he gets involved 
uh, immediately, and he wants to organize the republic as well, but he's got some different ideas. So one thing he puts a lot of focus on that Houston didn't in particular, not because he was opposed to it, but because they had different visions, was education. Uh, Lamar was really focused on setting aside public lands and public money to fund public education from elementary up to college level, and that's really the foundation of public education in Texas today. Interestingly, there's a lot of fights about it today, uh, public education and how it goes. Did you know that in the Texas Declaration of Independence, one of the things that, you know, Texas has a lot of problems with Mexico. You're, you're trying to uh, take our arms away. You're, uh, you're um, uh, interrupting our commerce. You're not allowing us to worship God freely. And also one of them was you're not properly funding public education um, in the Declaration of Independence. So he's, he's really passionate about that. He has an idea about the Capitol. It definitely shouldn't be in a place called Houston. <laughs> so he has the capital moved to this little place called Waterloo, which eventually develops into Austin. Now this isn't just purely, I hate Houston. This also is a vision of Lamar's, which is unlike, the United, um, unlike Houston, who wanted Texas to become a state in the United States. Lamar is adamant. Well, Texas should not become a state. Texas should remain an independent republic. And not only should it remain an independent republic, it should expand, and it should expand all the way to the Pacific. And so part of putting the capital in what is today Austin was to say, we're gonna put it on the what at the time was the far western frontier of settlement with the idea that Texas would be expanding. He also had something else to say in organizing the Republic. He, he had something to say about the flag. The original flag of the Republic of Texas was this, the Burnett flag from 1836 to 1838, and Mirabel Lamar wasn't gonna have any of that because, well, that's the flag of San Houston. So he introduced this one, which you may recognize today. So just a couple of pokes in the eye to San Houston to get things started. What about his vision for diplomacy? Well, he was friendly to the United States, but as I told you, he was very much focused on Texas remaining an empire. And one of the first things he did um, was that he wanted to get recognition from European nations. And it's during this period that Britain and France and the Netherlands recognized Texas as an independent republic. It took a couple of years. What about his diplomacy with native peoples? Well, it, the visions could not contrast more. I'm gonna read you just a very short quote from Lamar's first message to Congress. Okay, so remember Houston called for friendly relations and commercial relations and respect. And <coughs> In Lamar's first message to the Texas Congress, he called for the prosecution of an exterminating war on Indian warriors, which will admit no compromise and have no termination, except in their total extinction and total expulsion. Slightly different vision. And this is the man who was elected to be president. This isn't an unpopular person. Very different views about where people belong in Texas at the time. Now, he has some reason to be afraid. This is one example. Fort Parker, uh, right during the time of the uh, Texas Revolution in 1836, there was a, uh, a settlement that came mostly of this Parker clan that moved down from kind of the Illinois, Missouri area, uh, near, relatively near Waco. And one day, uh, a Comanche band raided the fort, killed most of the people there, many people escaped, and they took several people uh, captive, including a nine-year-old girl named Cynthia Ann Parker, who grew up with the Comanche, married a Comanche leader. Their son was Quanah Parker, um, who became the very last, later, the very last Comanche band leader to uh, agree to move on to a reservation, sort of fought till the end. Um, so there's a reason to be afraid of some native peoples for Anglos in Texas, because things like this are happening. But there's not a one size fits all, because Lamar feels the same way about the Cherokee. The Cherokee who were invited to move to Texas by the Spanish and the Mexicans. The Cherokee who um, had already established strong diplomatic relations with the Houston administration and who had land and settlements and communities in North Texas at the time. Lamar had deep suspicions of them as he had of all native peoples. He believed they were colluding with Mexico to take Texas back, which they were not. There was no proof of this and they had no interest in doing that. And so at one point he sent 500 troops um, to what he called negotiate, but by negotiate he meant leave now or we will make you leave. And when they didn't leave immediately, these troops made them leave. They drove the Cherokee out, murdered over 100 people, forced them out of Texas, and they wouldn't be allowed back. <laughs> and 
and then diplomatic relations with Mexico. As I told you, Houston was trying to maintain detente, like let's, we need to just not fight anymore and figure this out. But Lamar wants to expand. He wants all of that disputed land I showed you earlier that ran between kind of the Rio Grande and the Nueces, right here, and all the way up. He wants that land. And what he particularly wants to go after is Santa Fe, which you can see up in the top left, right? Which, of course, today is in New Mexico, but at the time would have been considered part of Texas, certainly by many Texans. He tries to buy it. Mexico says no. So he decides he's going to take it. You know, he's going to try to take it. Um, he asks Texas Congress for funds to support a campaign to go and take Santa Fe, which is on a major trade route that goes all the way over to St. Louis and through the United States. It's an important spot, the center of northern uh, Mexico, northern New Spain. Congress rejects his request for money, and so he says, well, okay, I'm not going to send a military campaign. I want to authorize a trade expedition. And if this trade expedition happens to have a lot of soldiers with guns, that's, that's a separate issue. So that's what he does. He authorizes a trade expedition, sends several hundred people, most of whom are basically soldiers, to try to take Santa Fe, and it's an absolute colossal failure. It's so well known that by the time they get there, there are Mexican troops there waiting for them. They're all captured. They're all taken down to Mexico City and put in prison. And even a lot of Lamar fans are pretty upset about this ridiculous international debacle. So much so that there are letters heading to Mexico City from some Texans saying, we'll trade you a few dozen Texans for one president. <laughs> you can have it. Um, so very, very different visions. Now, uh, I'll just conclude here by saying that after the Lamar administration, Sam Houston is actually elected again for a second presidency. But what you end up with at the end of the republic, after about nine or ten years, is this empire or republic that's under duress and is kind of stillborn, right? It had this idea that it would become this new thing, but they, it's very difficult, almost impossible to defend their own boundaries. There's significant disagreement about who gets a say and who even belongs or counts as a Texan. Uh, they have people, enemies, pressing in from the west by the Comanche and from the south by Mexico. Also, they're deeply in debt, deeply in debt and not knowing how they're going to get out of it. This republic is unsustainable and the only answer that everyone finally agrees on, almost everyone agrees on, is annexation. And so in 1845 and 1846, Texas people and the Texas leaders vote overwhelmingly to join the United States as a hope of solving a lot of these problems that they couldn't quite solve on their own. So that's it for today. Thank you. Wow. I'm glad to take questions I, I, and y'all just jump in and tell me to stop talking or leave when I need to. Yes, sir. I always thought that the Lorenzo de Salva flag was the first flag of the Republic, but apparently not. Why am I? Why did I think that? There's some confusion. I, I, I honestly can't keep up with it either because there, there are a lot of flags of early Texas. So the Zavala one is the blue one with the white star and the Texas. Um, it had some role during the revolution, but I'm, I'm, pretty, sh I'm pretty sure that this, the burnt this flag was the one that was adopted for the, those first couple years of the Republic. You're definitely, you're definitely right. I just, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I, listen, I know better than, I know just as well as anyone that like in Texas, there are people who know way more about Texas history than I do. Um, so it, it's, it's very possible. Maybe you're not one of them. <laughs> no, I tell my students all the time, students will ask something and I'm, I'm quick to say, I, I don't know the answer to that. I'll try to find that out. Um, yeah. But key for today, what I do know is that Mira Bolomar was like, it ain't going to be the one that was before me. Yeah. It's going to be this one. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So what continued role did Stephen F. Austin have? Um, not much. I'm trying to remember exactly when he passed away, but it was pretty soon. He was not actually very healthy, even in 1836. He was an older, he was getting up there in age and... Um, but not, but not much role at all, truly. Um, there was kind of a grandfather respect for Austin, but there was a rapid, rapid change in 1835, 1836, where you know the revolution, the Texas Revolution came on pretty quickly, and it came on led by mostly very new settlers. 
Stephen F. Austin was among, if not the most reluctant revolutionary. He put off for years any sense of revolution because frankly for him, it was just bad business. It was bad business. He was running a, a impresario contract trying to get people to come and settle, build farms, and um, he was the you know part of trying to work out a deal where Texas could even have enslaved people because Mexico had already out outlawed it and they had just kind of given a pass to Texas for purely for economic reasons. Um, so they were he and people like him were very slow to, for the revolution to come at all. So when it sweeps in very quickly, led by you, know, you think of all these the people you think of as like the Texas Revolution heroes, the Davy Crockett's and the Jim Bowie's and Sam Houston's, those are new people. They had not. I mean, Davy Crockett came to Texas like weeks before the Alamo. He's yeah, from Tennessee also. <laughs> um, a lot of the older leaders um, were, were reluctant and were certainly not right at the front of that. So when the Republic gets going, the, many of those leaders, including Austin, kind of take a back seat. <laughs> yes, sir. When did the current boundaries, the Western boundaries, when did they become what they are today? They worked their way out, but not really until about 1850. So a little bit after this Republic period, um, the first boundary gets set at the Rio Grande and, and the Mexican War when uh, the United States just takes it. <laughs> the United States started this war with Mexico, and, uh, but after that war won with Mexico, set the Rio Grande as the southern boundary, and then basically in a deal with the federal government in 1850, in exchange for money to pay off its debts, Texas allows the boundaries to be drawn where they are today between Texas and New Mexico, those, those lines. So they agree to give up that land in exchange for money to pay off the remaining Texas debt that had been carrying over since the revolution. Yes? You talked about property, the importance of primary sources. So yes. What, what's kind of your commentary on primary sources for Texas history? Well, so the primary sources are, are, are key for any study of history because what they do at very base is force us to actually contend with the things that people did say rather than what they said through our lens. <laughs> um, and in Texas history right now, they're really important. Uh, one of the things that I've been stressing with my students is that uh, we're having a lot of arguments today about issues about, particularly about things like race in our society and how we talk about them and how we deal with them. And there's a lot of arguments today that uh, uh, that presume that we're bringing our own problems, you know, related to race issues to the, to the past and that these are the things that, um, you know, that given places like Texas that sort of fought for freedom and all this that we don't, that we don't, uh, we're reading back into it. And one of the really important things about reading early Texas documents is that, um, that they're really not shy about what they think. They're really not shy about it at all. And so uh, when you go back and read these documents, and one of the reasons they're not shy is because they're not speaking to our current day. Like they don't have their, our hangups and ooh, what should we say and not say, they have their own hangups. But because they had a different time, they will say things that we might not expect them to say. Right? So for example, they'll say things like, uh, you need to fund public education and stop arguing about whether the Texas should fund it or not. This is not, you know, this is not a, a negotiable. But they'll also say things like in the Texas Declaration of Independence that um, everyone can be a citizen except black people and native people. You're not allowed. And in fact, if you're African, this is in the Texas Declaration of Independence. If you're black, you are either enslaved or you should leave. Um, and so going back and looking at these things in early documents allows us to kind of contend with the issues they were dealing with at the time and the way that people were thinking about them in ways that should in, that should better inform the way we talk about them, right? Which is not to talk about them primarily as ways to like gain a point in our in our own political battle, but as ways to understand this is where we came from, this is who we are, and we need to deal honestly with it, and then make our decisions for today in light of those two things. Hope that was a helpful answer. Tell the group about the lecture series. Oh, sure. Thank you. I did not feed that question to you at all. <laughs> <laughs> so I, 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 um, uh, I work at the um, SMU Center for Presidential History, which is sort of a cousin center to the history department at SMU. And one of the things we do is offer uh, public events, lecture series, 
throughout the year on topics related to presidential and American history. They're always free, um, and so we'd love if you think about it, go check us out, smu.edu slash cph, and you can see all the events uh, that we're hosting. We actually had an amazing event last night. I wish I could have been able to speak to you just a few days before and told you about it. Um, by a, a professor of history um, at Harvard, Annette Gordon-Reed, probably the greatest scholar of Jefferson who's ever lived, and she has this new book on Juneteenth, which, I mean, if, you, if you're a Texan, like, you should read this book. It's an incredible book. Um, but we've got events coming up <clears throat> this spring on World War II and, and Japanese-American incarceration. We've got one on um, the, uh, the election of Truman, the Dewey-Truman election, and um, we, we would love for you to come and tell your friends about them. Have a good time. That's how I, I've gotten to know Karen over the last few years. Anything else? Oh. Any other? All right. <laughs> the time very much. So um, let's see his <clears throat> closing remarks. So next week, uh, Youth of the Month, um, will be a great program. Two weeks um, from now will be our candidate forum. Uh, so kind of a busy back-to-back -back Friday, so look forward to that. Um, Kyle, Lucy, Campbell, uh, thanks for being here this morning. You're uh, welcome anytime. And let's see, any other parting announcements? Auction items, keep thinking, um, keep driving there. So, look forward to a great event. Yes, sir. I heard we're in the pharmacy business. Is that true? Pharmacy business. Yeah. <laughs> Our website. Probably <laughs> <laughs> got the Did anyone go to our website? <laughs> <laughs> no. I've seen some things you weren't supposed to see. So thank you, Rick. <laughs> Interesting. I've learned more about that here. Now. Uh, all right. So, y'all have a great Friday. <laughs>